So the story of Zacchaeus, a wee little man, uh, is pretty familiar within Christian communities. If you grew up in the Christian church or if your family received a, a little kid's book of Bible stories, um, that's a good one to put into the Bible story book for kids because it's pretty, uh, pretty innocent, right? Um, so it's somewhat familiar, but I was just interested. Um, early service, you know, we have fewer people. We've done this in the late service too, a little Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina means focusing on the word, the inspired word. Um, but it's also giving the congregation an opportunity to kind of share what you heard, what arose or bubbled up from the text. And so just for a few minutes, um, did anybody hear anything unique or different or odd that kind of bubbled up in that gospel text this morning? Yes, Aaron. Now when Jesus called him. Yeah. Go ahead. Jesus called him. I don't, I don't know. Check, check. Hello? Yep. There we go. Just uh, how when Jesus called um, him out of the tree, he didn't say, can you take me to your home? He said, you must, I must stay with you. So he, it was, it was almost like, I must, not can I, but I must. Yeah, there's not, it's not a, he invited himself, right? Uh, Jesus basically said, come to your house to eat tonight. Like it or not, like it or not, right? That's interesting, right? Interesting part of the text. Anybody else? We're passing the mic so all our friends online can hear them. Otherwise, I'm repeating everybody. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to repeat you now. <laughs> Ah, yeah, that's so, good. So in part, what it made me think of is the word today means that in the person of Jesus, salvation is there. Woo, there you go. Today, I'm coming to your house. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your presence. Both Luke chapter 4, in which Jesus reads from the prophet Isaiah in the temple and proclaims that the year of the Lord's favor is present. And today is salvation in his household, representing the fact that Jesus is the fullness of salvation. It's here, right? Yeah, good stuff. Anybody else? Just a couple more. Yeah. Um, at the beginning where he says that, that uh, he was seeking to see who Jesus was, I don't think he had any clue what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. It means means he obviously had heard about Jesus, had no idea what he was about to experience, right? Kind of a, a life-changing moment, right? A, a perspective-changing moment, yeah. Lucy? Well, I think the fact that he was curious means he was seeking the Lord. Mm. And I cheated and I looked up something online, but it also <laughs> that being that a grown man shouldn't be climbing trees in that <laughs> yeah, That's true. That's for children. No, it is. It, and there's a parallel there that a grown man is climbing a tree who's believed to be short, yeah. right? to gain perspective, but you're also right, I think what I hear you saying, Lucy, is he was open to the encounter, right? Even though he didn't know what he was going to get out of the encounter, he was open to it. Yeah, Nani? You all are good preachers, all of you. Yeah, Nani's saying that uh, this idea of coming down, there's humility, an act of humility, to, to come down to actually be, begin the journey with Jesus, right? And the first part, just reiterate the first part, your comment. Leader, that's right. He was not just a tax collector. He was the ruler of the tax collectors in the CEB, or he was the head of the tax collectors. Which, by the way, throughout history, tax collectors are not the favorite people. <laughs> right? They still, aren't. they still aren't to this day. Um, yeah, Mike. So, Jesus' 
is on his way to Jerusalem, and Zacchaeus goes up a tree as Jesus is going to go up on a tree. Mm. And so we all have to go up on a tree at some point to follow Jesus. Mm, that's good too. Yeah, Zacchaeus goes up the tree. Jesus is the one who's to be hung on a tree, as translated from the Old Testament, the prophecy of the Messiah, um, and that all of us have to go up the tree at some point. Go out on a limb. Go out on a limb. There you go. Nice. I'm glad I didn't write a sermon this week. No, I, I, <laughs> this, this is all part of the process of being in the, this work of proclamation together. I'm I've been challenged by trying to figure out how to make the congregation a part of the sermon. I think Lectio lends itself to that. But, but you all have something to offer that's important that rises out of that text. So thank you for that. Good stuff. Well, let's go with one more. Yeah, Pam. Yeah. It's working. So that part about his negotiation, saying, I will reimburse four times the amount if I should cheat anyone. It's like still kind of holding on to a little control there, perhaps, and through a negotiation and through using his expertise as a leader of the taxpayers. I just that, thought that was odd. Why four times? Yeah. Wait, wait, don't, don't blow be... my sermon. Are you going to talk not, about the Levitical law? Just, just hold on. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the Levitical law in so, in so many terms. I'm going to just talk in practicalities, but that's a very important part of this text, right? So, I mean, the familiar part, the beautiful parts, the moments in the text is that you have this gentleman who is, he desires to at least get to see Jesus because you've, he's heard about Jesus. And there's a crowd in front of him. And in order to gain a new perspective, <laughs> he has to climb the tree to be able to see Jesus. And his expectation is he's climbing the tree in order to have an encounter Jesus for himself. What he didn't expect was that Jesus sees him. Okay, so the tree becomes for us a metaphor, right, for moving above the crowd that's blocking everything out for us to actually experience Jesus. Now, have you ever had the crowd in front of you in your life? Okay, you can name that crowd whatever you want. <laughs> Because it comes in many names. It's the busyness. It's the hectic pace. It's the, the people out there screaming at you that you should look like this or act like this or fit in this box, right? That's, that's the crowd. And, and Zacchaeus is tired of it, and he actually wants to see Jesus for himself. So there's an openness to Jesus. And in opening himself and climbing the tree, it's not just that he sees Jesus. Jesus sees him. Because Jesus is seeking us out, every one of us, at every moment. It's a part of the good Wesleyan tradition we call provenient grace, that God's love is there before we even know or acknowledge it. God's love is all around us. So the one who climbs a tree, which here's another interesting little fact about the text, is that we always uh, you know, claim that Zacchaeus is a little guy, short in stature. The CB actually indicates that he climbs a tree because he's so short, the actual Greek does not use the word short or diminished or we. <laughs> it actually mentions least. So Zacchaeus is considered to be the least in the community. He's a dirty, rotten tax collector, isn't he? Everybody go, dirty, rotten. <laughs> but he's not, is he? Because this comes back to what Pam is illustrating in, Jesus, in his response to Jesus and Jesus' response to Zacchaeus. Jesus sees Zacchaeus, tells Zacchaeus that because his life is open, his life now becomes the home where Jesus will now reside. I'm coming into your house. It's, he's not giving him a choice because his openness has now changed his perspective of who Jesus is. This, Jesus is no longer just a wandering prophet out there doing a bunch of good deeds. Now that Zacchaeus has actually made the effort to climb the tree to see Jesus, Jesus now inhabits everything about Zacchaeus. He becomes, like it or not, a Christ bearer. So he inhabits that today. Salvation has entered your house. The house also becomes another metaphor for our, for our lives. 
He does end up going, I guess, with Zacchaeus to his house, have a great feast, wine, laughing, telling stories. I'm sure that's what happened, right? I know it was. I know that's what happened. But the response that Zacchaeus gives to Jesus after Jesus says he's coming to his home to abide in the home of his life, right, is an interesting one. Because I always grew up assuming that Zacchaeus is kind of justifying himself because he's experienced Jesus. But that's not actually what the Greek says in the text. Anybody have the CB in front of them? Anybody have it? Can you pull it up real quick so I don't have to walk all the way over there? <laughs> you got it? Go ahead and read the line. Zacchaeus' response to Jesus after he says he's coming to his home, where he talks about what he's going to do with his wealth. Zacchaeus stopped. Oh. <laughs> Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. Did you hear it? Listen, Lord. And now this comes after the the community's response about him, right? Because what they're saying about Zacchaeus is he's a sinner. Dirty, rotten sinner. Zacchaeus comes down to the tree, turns, he says, listen, Lord. I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I ever do anybody wrong... I repay them. He's already doing it. He's not making a promise to Jesus. He's already living a righteous life. He's responding to the poor and the outcast the way any good person should, right? It also stands in contrast to a couple chapters before this one in which Jesus meets a rich young ruler. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, follow the law. He says, I do that. And he says, one thing you lack, give everything away, and then come follow me. And what does he do? He turns and walks away. This dirty, rotten sinner who's a tax collector is already doing that. He's already giving of himself in the way that a Christ follower should. You also notice Jesus never condemns him, never says, you dirty, rotten sinner. I I apologize, Nick said, and Jesus forgave him. Jesus never forgave him because there's nothing to forgive. No, what Jesus does is inhabits his life, becomes a part of his life. And in that process, he gains a new perspective. He can see the world differently because now he sees through the eyes of Christ We need to climb trees, my brothers and sisters, amen? My siblings, we need need to gain fresh perspective and get our eyes attuned to Jesus and not all the crowd, not all the mumbling and not all the conversations going around about who Jesus is or who Jesus loves or who Jesus... Jesus, that's all. Right? Don had a question. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, um. Yeah, I have to look into that, Emily. Um, yeah, Emily's asking: Is there significance to giving half away as opposed to giving everything away? Um, probably. Um, I'd have to look into it, but. Uh, a good question. What does giving everything away look like? You know? Right. Which I could turn this into a stewardship sermon. 10% nothing. 50%. 50%. You know, it's funny too because in our modern context we think 10% is too much, right? I mean most people do. Even though that's part of the our tradition. There's a tie, this difference that one time we gathered everybody together at Cornerstone and we had the groups and circles determine how much everybody should give. I, we let the congregation do it. And they actually, like a child, you know when a child gets in trouble and you let them punish themselves, right? And they usually give themselves 10 times worse punishment than you were going to give. The congregation actually came back with a higher percentage than 10%. I was shocked. It never came to fruition. (laughs) But there's so much going on. The the beauty of this text. So 
this is this is the joy of scripture, right? Is that it's not it's, none of it is a simple story. There's there's so much packed into the story, layers and layers and questions about wealth and possession and and following Jesus and who we are and how we're identified. Jesus sees Zacchaeus. He's considered to be the dirtiest, rotten scum in the whole town, right? But Zacchaeus is already living a life of purity in the best way he knows how. And now he's actually taken a step further. It's not just about being a good person anymore. He now knows salvation because he's met salvation in flesh. It's Jesus. The fullness of the love of God revealed in every aspect of life. You know, people always ask, you know, gosh, I feel so far away from God right now, or I'm struggling with my life, or I have tension and turmoil. I'm with you, my, my siblings. Anybody out there have doubts ever? Yeah? yeah? Lists of doubts, you know. In some ways, my doubts, for me, can seem like a crowd standing in front of me. And they're good, they're healthy, because what that does in my doubts and my questions and my frustrations, I just need to remember that I need to climb the tree. And in climbing the tree, I have to become like a child. Because remember, Jesus says something about children, doesn't he? He says, unless you become like a child, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There's something in humility and childlike faith that makes us go back up the tree to get our focus back on the thing that really matters. Sunday school answer, people? Jesus. Jesus. Right. That's a whole other sermon. <laughs> in its simplest form, the language that is being used currently in almost every seminary and, and across the Christian community, it's growing, is this idea of kingdom being a dominant kind of image. It was familiar in the ancient world. That's why they use it. But it also tends to kind of play with that idea of dominance over other people, a kingdom over this kingdom, that kind of the battles and wars and all that. So the shift was made actually at Candler Theological Seminary, which is a United Methodist Seminary, so you all know, was kin means the relationship that we have with each other. It's a kingdom where everyone, even Zacchaeus, that dirty rotten sinner who's actually a pretty good guy, is welcome. So it's the kingdom of God, not a, a worldly kind of dominant kingdom. There you go. Any other sermons you want me to preach this morning? <laughs> I can go on. Oh, okay, one more question, and we got to wrap it up. We'll be here till 3 o'clock, but that's all right. So that, that he was going to dinner with Zacchaeus? Well, it says that they were accusing him of going to dinner with a sinner, right? Yeah. They were caught back. You know what they did to Jesus, right? Oh, yeah. They crucify him. Uh -huh. um, that's, where, that's what love, by the way, just so you know, the gospel is not easy or safe. Let me just tell you that. It's dangerous. Because when you love people that way, the, the others, not the others from my book that are good people, but the others <laughs> surround the, ju the judgment and those who are trapped in the culture and society and the us versus them and the separation, the divisions that exist in the world, which lead to war and death, just so you know, okay? Um, those systems want to snuff out love because love is open to everybody. Yeah, everybody. Um, you kind of just reminded me, and I mentioned the early service, but um, it, it's this tension of naming, right? So 
the people respond to Jesus going with Zacchaeus says, well, how dare he go with that sinner? He should be with us. We're the righteous people, right? Okay? But Jesus isn't interested in that. He's interested in everybody. And especially the lost, the least, the broken, those who've been isolated or named or ex- excluded. A few months back, I preached a sermon on the prodigal son coming back to the father's house. And in that, I shared with you all that the important part of that parable, because we just go straight to the parable, but we don't read ahead. And I, you might not remember this, probably don't. But the very first verse before you get into that parable, Jesus is being accused by those around him for going to dinner and hanging out with sinners. Now, who's naming them sinners? The sinners, the, sinners, the crowd, right? It's not Jesus. So the father, when he receives the prodigal son, is receiving him in the fullness of grace, regardless of whatever label or identification the world has placed on the son who's departed. And it's the same way with Zacchaeus. And part of the work here at Cornerstone is to do our best. I fail miserably at this at times, too, because we can't help but sometimes get in our judgment and attitudes. I gotta, I gotta climb the tree, right? But it's to to do away with those barriers. You know? If anything, this community right here should be the most diverse place and collection of people on the earth. The church should be that, where everybody's welcome from every background and every skin color and every orientation and every financial and economic place in life, where we all gather together because we love Jesus and he's teaching us how to love one another. It doesn't mean we like everybody. That's, that's why I go to church. I go to church because I don't like all of you. I love you. And if I go someplace that's like a homogenized kind of situation where everybody's like me, I never grow in love. I just grow in familiarity and comfort. Complacency. And that's the danger of the gospel. Sheena, I'm going to tell you a little Sheena story. Sheena Brooke was our music director here. You know, she's had devastation on Fort Myers Beach, but she was on staff. We're at a staff meeting, <laughs> and, and uh, we're talking about breaking down the walls and barriers and how we want to invite people into the conversation from all these diversities, and she just stopped. She says, that's not going to work. I said, well, what do you mean? She goes, it doesn't work. You, you can't welcome everybody because somebody's going to play the game of excluding somebody else. And you all are thinking right now, that person (laughs) you might not want to come to church with, right? The person who doesn't like you, or is a racist, or you name it, or is a tax collector. And here's the gospel response to that, that I think Jesus would say. That's why we got to try because that's the hope we find in Christ. We're just foolish enough to believe that it could work because we've met Jesus when we were climbing a tree one day. And he didn't just walk by us. He actually said, hey, Roy, I'm coming to your house. You now know salvation. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.